Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Jerusalem to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are, and shalom, and welcome to Rabbi Mike Foyer. Oh, shalom, Ishai. Shalom, and it's great to be with you here at the old school, Beit Midrash Sulam Yaakov. What a feeling, what a special place. And I, I, I uh, got here, we, we, we made up to meet here in Jerusalem early, and, and Sulam Yaakov was still closed off. I went to Tkoa Street here, yep. went to the little underground Oh, I love that little there. Sparty Beit Midrash shul. Yes, Sparty Beit Midrash, cave. you know. Uh, and just uh, prayed a little bit there and did, did the thing. I love Nachlot. This is this is one of my favorite places. Me too. And if it wasn't for like being needing to be a, a settler in that fight, I would love to live here. This is that's one of my favorite places. If you're gonna do it, get in now because the prices are already astronomical. No, they're already yeah they're 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 out of control here. That's another thing. Everybody's talking about prices, and I always, I always like not always. When I was in college, I didn't. I I took I learned uh, political science, which I love. But I didn't uh, focus enough on economics. It's an important tool. Right. And today I'm really, I'm really trying to go back and trying to understand economics. And I listen to as much economics as possible. I have some poli-sci friends who don't delve in economics. And I always feel like you don't understand a certain bit of human behavior. I'm, like, I'm a Marxist in my heart, not necessarily because of his attitude on his conclusions about it. But in the understanding that the economic question is the fundamental question of both history and politics. Right. Absolutely. It, it's 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 certainly a great prime motivator. It's, it's yeah. A, it's a, yeah. It, and and to not and to not understand that is to kind of not understand trends and how people behave. Um, and I love looking at like little economic miracles. For example, one of my favorite economic miracles is on Route Four Four Three, which is the road basically between the airport and Jerusalem, and goes it goes to Modin, right? And there is this falafel stand right next to the Shlomo Karlbach. Town, which yes. is called Mavomodi. I know exactly what you're talking about. Passed of course it many you do. times. Of course you do. And everybody knows because because the world stops there. If you've ever stopped there, you're gonna have to wait for ten minutes yes. to be served falafel so because true. like everybody is there. And the falafel is good. Yeah. It's all about location, it's man. It's location. I think it's also another some kind of other ethereal thing. He's got a there's a thing that's yeah, a good, is. trustworthy, good place, it's comfortable, they'll clean keep it clean enough. In any case, enough being the important word there, right? <laughs> and uh, and Israel's like that also. Israel's this economic miracle, uh, and you could see it. And I'm 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 loving the dynamo. Oh, yeah. that you could feel in the country now. Oh yeah, it is an astounding thing. The, the sense of energy and life flowing through the streets. It's nuts. Yeah, it it's really wild. Is. It's wild, and it's and it's everywhere on different levels. Even in Hebron, which is like the far region, yeah. kind of like hidden away in a dark place. Still there, I could feel it. Yeah. There is there is money. Yeah. There's juice, lifeblood. Yeah, lifeblood is flowing. Yes, and it's flowing good. Yeah, you know? it's flowing good. I love to see that, and I think that also adds to part of our conflict, mm -hmm. because part of the conflict in the Middle East. And somebody once once said to me, like, you know, sometimes somebody says something to you in Torah, which is just like you're like, duh, oh my god, how did I not see that? Mm -hmm. Like, Cain comes from the word kina, jealousy, yeah. and Kenyan acquisitions. Right. Okay. Right. Good. <laughs> right. Like. There's an element of our enemies, there's an element that, that, and maybe a large element, if you listen to also the teachings of Dr. Mordechai Kedar, for example, there's a large element of jealousy. Oh, yeah. A large element of jealousy. And you know what? If I was them, dang, would I be jealous too? Sure. In the middle of this deserty region, famous British saying is that the Arabs are not the sons of the desert, they're the fathers of it. Uh -huh. Very kind of harsh statement, but, you know, take it. I didn't say it. Somebody Who's else British? Did. Right, exactly. <laughs> Like and then there's this shiny country in the middle, and it's only starting to be more and more polished and more and more shiny. And add to that that it was the dog's dog that built it, meaning the people that were seen as the outcasts of society, um, literally came out of the ovens of Europe and were spit out of you know every country in the Middle East, and all came together as refugees and said, "Well, heck, let's just build an economic dynamo." Right. So, and the first dynamo was like a military dynamo. Yeah. Right. It was like defense. Yep. Necessity, after necessity, all, necessity, and and like the necessity of the most necessity kind, not necessity like I need baby wipes, you know. No, it's well, like necessity of. It's important our listeners understand that in Hebrew, the word lechem and the word milchama are anagrams, meaning they share the same letters. I mean, the word for bread and the word for war are one and the same, really, in their essence. And the word halom, yes, which is dream. Okay, well, right. Once you get past the, once you ask the fight for bread, then you can dream about, and that's what's happening in the country today. 
Yeah, bigger dreams. Yeah, bigger. Much bigger dreams. You think about the role that we play in information technology and in binding the world together and in creating the means of communication where humanity can actually be as one. It's a fulfillment of our divine mission in a very physical sense. And you you could really see it, you know, if you, maybe we'll take an image from Ezekiel, from Yechezkel, of these like bones coming together, and the bones come together, and then the sinews kind of come on top of them, and the skin, and then they're standing there, and then and then he prophesi- prophesizes, prophesies. <laughs> he speaks in the name of the Lord. Prophecy <laughs> to, to, to the soul, and he, and he kind of like, you know, says, soul, go and get into that body, and, that, and that get, like, you see this, and a, a large standing army, Ready to do kind of God's work. Yeah, I, f- I feel in the country like such a dynamo right now, and then things like what happened yesterday, which is the the murder uh, of Rabbi Raziel Shevach. I think he was thirty five. Yeah, I was blown away by his uh, 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 CV, shall we say his his yeah. CV of a tzaddik. Yeah, like here's a guy who just became a rabbi, was known for his humor was known for his barbecues, was also known to be a ritual circumciser, was also known to be a volunteer paramedic, was known to have a tremendously good just humor and a a good atmosphere. And he would take these months right now, which we're starting the months of Shovavim, which is the Torah portions having to do with the the exile in Egypt and also at the same time correlation to uh, cleansing ourselves from... Uh, impurities that come through sexual sins and, 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 and improper desires. And he would take this month or a month and a half uh, as a Tani Dibur, as a fast from speaking, a, a um, wow, I silence period. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know either, but my brother turned me on to 5.31 a.m., which is Reshet Moreshet or Mor- Khan Moreshet, which is like a more Haredi type of radio. Uh-huh. And they basically interviewed his brother and stuff like that. Like you hear uh-huh. more. The more inside the right. family story. Right. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <clears throat> and back to the dynamo versus the murder, which is like, there's this, there's this, L- oh, and then Hamas released the most amazing statement, Rabbi Mike Foyer. What did they say? They said, the West Bank will continue to be a sword in your side. That sounds familiar. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> you know, you know when, when, me, 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 right? Right, it's like, yeah. it's, Of course, Rabbi Mike and I are, are alluding to something, which is a famous verse that says you're going to be, if you leave the, the folks on the land, if you leave, leave the jihadists of various kinds in your land, there'll be sticks in your sides and thorns in your eyes, or the opposite way, sticks yep. in your eyes, thorns in your sides. But they were like, hey, me, Hamas, which in Hebrew means An violent act of crime. Violent, not just violent crime, but a violent taking of something which is not yours. Right. Specifically. Right. Uh, we call it mugging. You yes. Know, it's a mugging. That's what their name is. Hi, my name is Mugging. Uh, and, uh, and then they're like, and, and guess what? We're going to be a thorn in your sides. Unless you deal with us. Deal with me. Yeah. Read the book, people. Right. Do you remember The Little Prince? Yeah, sure. Le Petit Prince? Yeah, for sure. You read it in the French? Oh, uh, no. No. Uh, he says things. He's the, the fo- I, never, I, I don't know why this always sticks out in my mind. The, the fox comes up to him and he's like, He's like, come, come, hang out with me. He's like, no, you got to tame me. You've got to tame me. That's the only way it's going to work. That's the only work. way it works. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, you got you to gotta tame these guys. Yeah. Chazak. Well, I mean, and, and to go back to your economic dynamo, one of the challenges that we face is um, if you made a topographic map, but instead of elevation, you put it as mean income, you will see that we're sitting on a mountaintop here. And basically, when you cross the edge of Yudan Shomron and you head eastward you're just it get lower and lower now there's some peaks there if the, the saudis are sitting jordan on, is full of poverty people yeah, don't know yeah i mean the saudis Iraq, are sitting on a mountain it's, of oil it's, it's like a hundred years the, it's like a, a thousand know, years ago the, the kuwaitis are sitting on a mountain of oil but everybody else you know is just in in the pits and one of the things that i see is in the future and it may god forbid be after the type of war that happened last time but a martial plan for the middle east and 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 it's going to have to be led likely by us because we have the know-how and we have the capability. But the Marshall Plan after World War II really was dependent on the fact that the defeated understood that they had lost. And, and that's kind of the place that we haven't yet reached in the region. Is that if you're going to fight evil, you don't, you don't sort of fight evil to a standstill and say, okay, now we can be friends. Right? You need to break the, bra- break the back of evil in, in order to then say, and, and the good people who are suffering under it, and there are many good people in the Arab world who are suffering under evil, Right? When you break the back of evil and you say, now, let's rebuild. That's why peace is a dirty word. 
it's a dirty word because right now what we need to talk about is victory, or an, I like another word which is completely illegal now, which is vanquish. And, and on the heels of that is what we spoke about last week is justice. Economic justice right, is, is not something that we should shy away from because we feel like you know, the liberal world has seized the high ground of economic justice and by definition we are unjust. So this is simply not true. And so, therefore, I agree with you that peace, I don't know if it's a dirty word, but it's certainly, um, the, the, you know, the, I don't disagree with peace now. It's the now part that's problematic, you know? I, it, I, here, you and I, just a, a tad differ, kind of, uh, you know, just at the very end of the highway, you, you're taking a little bit of a, you know. Turn to the left. You take the left, I'll take the right. <laughs> I actually think that, that peace is a dirty word in the sense that peace is a beautiful word. It is one of the names of God. It is the vessel that holds old things, our sages tell us. But in the hands of the the, um, the the genius propagandists and and, uh, and 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 their ilk, what they mean is weakness. Well, I mean, what you're getting at is the fact that just because we use the same word doesn't mean we're talking about the same thing, right? And well, a little bit more than that, that that those people will use that word in an attempt to own and manipulate. Right. That's what language is, no question. Yeah, language is awesome. I love it. Um, Personally, I had uh, some some uh, emotional challenges this week, uh, and and uh, I, I I felt a, a kind of darkness um, come over me about a few different issues. And though I love you folks so very much, you will permit me to keep some parts of my life to myself a little bit in the dark. In the yeah, and but but uh, to the extent I feel comfortable talking about it, I will say that just certain things in my life just. Um, uh, 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 were f- just I, I saw everything in the in the dark light, and there was a part of me in my brain. I have what's called in Hebrew a luach bakara. Mm-hmm. What is that in English? Uh, like a, 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 not an alarm, but a um, dashboard. A dashboard, yeah, a dashboard. dashboard. I have a dashboard with instrumentation. Right. And that, uh, that dashboard said to me, "You're overheating. You're you're angry. You're ticked off, and that's not your training, sir." Says the dash. You know, add some oil. Believe in you know, have emuna, have Throttle faith. back. Right, and, and remember that 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 uh, that it's all from God, and all that stuff, all the good stuff came to me intellectually, but it was not enough to defeat the dark stuff. Yeah, and 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 this morning as I was driving over here to meet with you, and I was listening as I often do to the Torah portion being read on YouTube. Uh, I listened to it just uh, as a as a Kriyata Torah, and by the way, that's just a little recommendation of of mine to you. I listen to the Torah portion being read like Torah. Throughout the week, and then when Shabbos, it's like the whole... It's all there. It's all there, and it's the live version, you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like listening to the album and then seeing the band, oh. you know? And I had, a, I had a, a, a realization, I'm just very excited to tell you about it, and to develop it with you, really. Excellent. And that is that we are... This is the Torah portion of Pharaoh and the Plagues. You've seen the movie, okay? That's right. It's the big showdown at the OK Corral. Right. This is it. And there's gunslinging. Mm-hmm. Right. There's, yeah, for sure. Right. There, God is is and and the rabbis say something which I think is uh, to quote President Trump. I'm just acknowledging the obvious here, which is which is that that God unleashed, uh, kind of removed the the, the normal the normal um, way things are. Oh, sure. That's right. what the story is about. In right. Ways. It's like it's like it's like culminating at the Red Sea. I'm, I'm yeah, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna at the klafim. Like I'm gonna yeah. go nuts. Yep. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make. I'm going to make your world, because you think you control this world, right? right? You think that I'm in the heavens, maybe, or the gods are in the heavens. I'm going to, no, I'm going to show you that I'm also in control of this ball, this little And you don't even understand how the world works. Right. You think you do. You think you're a god, but you're not. Right. You're just a created dude, and I can play around with the whole thing, which is radical, because really, basically, in, in, the, in Bereshit, we basically had a, a god that followed rules that he set out. The rules are all thrown out here, right? Yep. And we're used to thinking that that Pharaoh is the bad guy, right? Sure. And the Jews are the good guys. The good guys. But I started thinking to myself, Yishai, aren't you being a bit of a Pharaoh? Ooh. Because I got signals, many signals from the Lord. And when you live with the, with God, little signals come up, and you have to learn to to read them, to relax the old heart. Mm-hmm. But my heart hardened against it. Uh, the mind, the good mind, yeah. the good teachings. We're like the Jews, untouched. Yep. Knew exactly what he was supposed to do. Right. But the heart was like, no, I shall not let your people go. Yeah. I shall not. I don't want to be free. Right. I am, I am angry 
and I will not I will not unclench. And maybe you know that you know, and maybe maybe the maybe there are good reasons. Yeah. There could be good reasons. It's not uh, <laughs> It's certainly I mean legitimate reasons. I mean good is already right. a moral judgment. Yes. But like you know, they're just like you said, substantive reasons. Anger has a real force. Yeah, thank you. Uh, correct. <laughs> I like that you said that. That's right. <laughs> You're thinking about your week. <laughs> just I just I like that correction. You're right. They're not necessarily good reasons. They're they're legitimate. Could be perceived as legitimate. In any right. case, so I just realized that. By the way, I do a lot of this work. If you ever want to like get the couch, oh, I know, <laughs> I know you do, I know you do, and I have availed myself of the couch. I was even thinking about calling you this week, but uh, but I was too angry to call you. Uh, that's always the sign. I was too angry because because you, you didn't want to hear what I had to say in that moment. Because uh, I. Because I would have guessed what you had to say, and I'm like, but I don't want him to help me yeah. laugh. Feet That's always the to sign. get rid of the It's anger. beautiful. It's beautiful. So what does it tell you here about how we understand the story? Then I hear something, but you were in the middle of a of an insight. I just 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 that 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 it's easy to paint it as though Jews are these you know they were they're they're these plagues, and and the Jews are uh, are the good and Pharaoh is the bad. But then I started realizing maybe there's a part of us which is Pharaoh. Maybe there's maybe there's also a fight here between the soul and the body. Where Pharaoh represents the body that refuses to kind of to kind of give in to the soul, and the soul is like this good, pure thing that is not as untouched, and and, and but but Pharaoh, that's like really our bodies, uh, which 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 yearns for something different, and and sometimes even though it's righter, and it knows it's righter, still can't really like go, can't can't be defeated, and that's the hardening of the heart. Well, I'll tell you what the. How we let our ideas move us to action is one of the most important skills that a person can learn in the world in order to to actualize our beliefs. Um, so I'm going to share with everybody listening an insight about myself that you shared with me, which I don't know if we've said it here before, but you once pointed out to me, oh, I get it. You're actually really conservative in your kishkas, in your gut, but your mind is very liberal. Um, and, and that's very much the split that I hear in the scripture you're making. And one more piece is that, that I was always taught by my rabbi that, that one of the ways we should learn the Chumash, we should learn the Torah. Wait, wait, just how did you connect that? Just that first point? That, that, that the, 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 the liberal mind and the conservative embodiment don't always work together. Right, and, right. And, and I'm coming to the question of how do you actually <clears throat> work with the hardening of one's heart? Assuming that one's mind is correct, which by the way... Is not always true. Correct. Right. It's not always true. But in this case, if we're going to make Paro the hardening of the heart and, and Amisrael having these, the Moshe, let's just embody Amisrael and Moshe for a minute. Moshe's getting the direct line. He knows exactly what God wants. But he can't seem to get Paro to do what's right. So I was always taught that one of the ways you should learn the Chumash is it's written in order to teach you about yourself. And one of the ways to do that is you should be every character Which in the story. Which is this? Ralph Daniel Cohen, mm. who's, the, who's the Rav of Bat Ayin. Right. Is that you should see yourself when you read this narrative as every character in the story. Put yourself into each place as you're reading it. Right. And it becomes an inner dialogue as you're pointing out. Right. And so you know what the power is? Do you know how the primary tool that the Torah teaches us to move thoughts from our mind and to get rid of that hardness of the heart is prayer. Right? It is avodah shebalev. It's the service of the heart. And as such, it's how we're able to let ourselves feel what it's like to know what we know. We know that God loves us. We know that Mashiach is coming. We know we were chosen for a divine mission. What does that actually feel like? Well, life gets in the way because those are scary thoughts or, or they're abstracts or, or maybe they come with a lot of baggage or whatever. And, and, and prayer is that holding of that space. What does it feel like to really be loved by God? What does it feel like to know that Mashiach is coming? What does it feel like to be filled with a sense of mission? I, I think I know what you're talking about. Specifically, with regarding to this week, uh, I did try a prayer when I was gritting my teeth in, in full-on uh, anger. Uh -huh. I said, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being angry right now. Thank you, God, for this thing that I'm ticked off on and this thing and this thing and this thing. And that's something that I, that I learned from um, uh, the, the Breslov kind of uh, direction. Ravarish. Ravarish. And I, I did that. It helped somewhat. And I, it, did, it did open a little petach shel machat. A little bit of breathing room. A thread of a needle, yeah, you know. Yeah. The, I have a needle. I have the needle to, to you know, into the heart, and it, it, yeah. Once you have a little bit of a breathing room, it starts to, kind of the the pus starts to come out. The, yeah, the well, bile. Because there's something strangely satisfying about about feeling bad. Yes, it is a also because it it's a consuming state, and, and and in that sense, it has a, a strange comfort to it. 
Well, it's selfishness, really. There's it, also it, that for it, sure. I, I think I think if you if you listen to the, what the sages say, "Kina hatava vakavod motzinat adam in olam," which is one of my favorite phrases, which is the jealousy, the uh, wanton desire, and honor, and self-aggrandizement take a person out of this world. If you think about all those things, they're really they all have the same things, which is me, me, me. It's all about center. me, and yeah. that takes you out of the world because now it's all about me. Right. Yeah, I think and that's very no, true. And, oh, and another thing that the rabbis say well, well, is that a person who's anger. Uh, uh, first thing, call me Negehenom Sholtimbo. Yeah, it's right? so all true. kinds of hell, hell just rule over him, right? They right. just so, take over. It's so true. Foof, foof. Anyway, and and hell has a power, you know. Oh yeah, hell has a power. Oh yeah, even if it's just one we create, right? Okay. Well, let us pray. Let us just stop for a second and actually make a tiny prayer here. Uh, that uh, that the the good. You know, are, are, are I like an American expression, or maybe it's maybe it's even a Christian expression. I don't know. Our better angels, I like that that mm-hmm. little phrase. Our better our better angels should rule over us. Our sages certainly believed in angels, so you can make it a Jewish one, too. right? Yeah, but that's just that that that, that turn of that the phrase. phrase. Sure, uh, that our better angels should 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 rule over us. I mean, and that uh, we succumb to the to to the to that that white, you know that that. The, the good light, and to really see that everything is for the good. Also, I have to say that the murder of the rabbi was like a slap in the face. This happens yeah. to me every time. Every time I feel bad for myself. I remember one time I, my throat was hurting, and I was at a doctor's office, and I was like, oh, my throat is hurting. And the minute I thought that thought, I saw somebody in a wheelchair in some kind of horrible situation. Yeah. It's always like a slap in the face. Yeah. Like, like, hey, buddy, your throat is hurting. It's not a biggie, okay? Oh yeah, I tell you with the and, and a, a rabbi with a father of, a, of of six children, a rabbi who's, I'm sorry, I have not reached his level of righteousness. I could say that officially, you know, and and, and he gets gunned down by by these uh, Hamasnikim, you know, wrecking the life of of his beautiful children and and his family. Well, hopefully and, not wrecking, but bringing but whatever incredible, yeah. incredible pain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, again, again, strength. I accept that correction, and, and, and that's right. Amen. Uh, but 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 it 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 it. it Puts it all in perspective. Yeah. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you today is the yort site of the uh, first Lubavitcher Rebbe. Oh, really? The Alter Rebbe, uh, the Schneer Zalman Miliari. Mm. And um, I know that because uh, I had a chance to do something yesterday, which I almost always jump at the opportunity to do when they call me. And that is I am involved. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. Uh, you know, this is one of these godly things. Um Kolel Chabad, one of the organizations that was created by Shneur Zalman Miliari. Yep. In fact, he sat in jail because he sent money to, to the, the land of Israel. Yeah, that was Israel. what put him in jail. Yeah. Right. So Yishai Fleischer gets to be, they have, the, there's a modern problem. They have an event, they want to live stream it. People live stream events. Sure. But there's a problem with live streaming an event. What's that? Somebody's going to know how to do it. <laughs> no, they, the, if you just video the event, either. First thing, it's in Israel, so half the people that are watching it from outside don't, don't understand know. what's going on. Right, yeah, yeah. Second thing, a, a, two to, a, a screen on a, on a kind of live public event is somehow very boring. It yeah. needs... Somebody to engage. Narration. Ah, you narrated the event? I do the... Baruch Hashem, I've gotten the schut to do the live stream events for Kolel Chabad. Wow. I do the live stream events. Are they based in Hebron? No no no, 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 no. It's a Chabad has a, a real deep connection to Chabad. Yes, maybe. yes, but but they are, they are a countrywide separate, thing. Separate, and, yeah. and, they, and they do stuff for, for orphans of the IDF. And yesterday they opened up a giant new building uh, next, to, not far from the central bus station here yeah. for people with MS and other neurological God, diseases. God bless Chabad. You can't even believe this thing, man. Yeah. There's a room there that you can, it's a music room. You can create music with just moving your eyes. When wow. I saw, when I saw, now, now there were VIPs, very wealthy people came I'm in. I'm sure. It's a, it looks like a, I, I don't know how much it cost, but it, it could easily be, I don't know, anywhere between 20, 50 million dollars. Talking about something big. Serious. We're talking about something big. Sure. And all that was cool. Then you saw the folks who suffer from MS. Right. Rolling in. Right. On, uh, and wheelchairs. They're, and they're and twisted. Yeah. Yeah, MS is a brutal disease. It's they're twisted. It's a brutal. I've and, known a couple of people who've suffered from it. It's yeah. a brutal, brutal Ugh. disease. And you're just like, and then the love that they got from people around them and stuff like that. Anyway, it was very moving. So I just wanted to tell you that that's another example. First thing where I saw yesterday, like, you know, um, the perspective, right, and the and, gratitude that comes with it, and kindness, and kindness, uh, kindness of people dedicated to kindness. Yeah, it is Amazing an awesome, awe-inspiring thing. To awe-inspiring say. thing. 
All right, here we go. Uh, Torah portion is Vaera, and we're talking about we're gonna we're gonna get in a second to the plagues, the various plagues. We're gonna do a big chunk of the plagues, but not all of them. Yeah, not all of them. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we're gonna do what? I think so. We're gonna do lice. We're gonna do six or seven of them. I forget yeah. the exact count. All right. Well, we'll we'll do we'll do the frogs. We'll do the blood. Yep. Uh, the hour of the mixed wild animals. <laughs> <laughs> the untamed animals. Right. Um, and we're gonna do also the uh, the um, uh, what's it called uh, boils. Yeah, I think it's everything but darkness. Um, Bechorot, a, firstborn, firstborn, and hail. Maybe hail's the no hail's in this week's hail's at the end of this one. We'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. Right. We'll see. Thing. But before we get there, we I, I'd like to focus more uh, in the time that we have today. Um, and we don't have so much time, but I, I would like to focus more on the first part because the first uh-huh. part is this awesome thing, and it and mirrors a little bit the first Torah portion in the in the book of the Bible, which is Bereshit, where God tells us first a story, and then he goes back and he says, let me give you the big picture again, right? So we went very in-depth. We went into the house of a Levite, yep. a Levite, con- a female Levite conceived, and then there was this great light. It was a Moses, and he went downstream, and then he came out, and he was supposed to rescue his people. And he fo- Remember all the stuff that we talked about last sure. week? But now, oh, and, and, and finally, the, at the end of last week's Torah portion, Moses was like, hey, God, you know, this why, ain't working. <laughs> why have you done bad to your people? Right, you sent me, and it only made things worse. Wow. Right. And then God says, "Come, come over here. I want to show you something. Let me have a, Let's have a chat, okay? Right. And let me give you the big picture. Right. And these, this first, uh, this first Torah portion is. Sometimes I wonder. I, I'd like to talk to the sages and say, why don't you make us read this one more in some of the prayers? I would, I would like to read this. I like. But okay, that's that's just a question. Not a big deal. It's not a kasha. It's, yeah, it's just a God forbid. Yeah, it's just a question. So it says like this. Vayomer, I think we should read this together. Vayomer Elokim and Moshe, Vayomer Elav Ani Hashem. So God, the God of nature, kind of the God of uh, nor- world God, world God, says to Mo- Moses, and he says to him, "I am God." But this time, using the word tetragrammaton. Right. <clears throat> I showed myself, next verse says, I showed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the name of El, El Shaddai, Shaddai. Uh, which is what? I mean, there are a number of understandings, but it's in many ways the, the power which bounds, right? The, right? the one which places things in their proper place in creation. And specifically, our sages understood it as, as the name of God which makes promises which are not yet fulfilled. Mm-hmm. That's right. To me, though, uh, uh, and I and I'm, uh, I have we talked about this a few weeks ago. To me, it's almost always linked up with also fertility and yes. growth. Sure, you will be a great nation, in other words. But my name, the tetragrammaton, the four letter name, I did not reveal myself to them, which is weird. And not how I would translate it. Okay, go ahead. Because when it says Ushmi Hashem Lo Nodati Lahem, they knew God's four-letter name. This is right. where we're very familiar. Avram called upon God in that name, but I was not known to them through this name. Right. And this opens up for us a whole world of... We just went through three, di- three different names. Exactly. And right. it opens up for us at the end here, the whole world of... What, like, what does it mean that God has different names? And that sounds slightly idolatrous, like one God, many names. What is that? And one of the things it is, is that as we actually were just indirectly speaking about, is that the names of God are indicative of the modes of relationship between creator and created. And what, what he's saying to Moshe is this is the Avot knew me in the world through the promises, through the through the fertility and the sort of like their primary goal was that there should be continuity, right? But they haven't seen the fulfillment of those problems. They haven't seen me actually transform the world as I promised them I would. And Moshe, we're up. It's time. You're up. Yeah, you're up. <laughs> like you thought I was just sending you down to like take these people out of like the socio political condition of slavery. No, 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 no. Right. This is a, this is a, a existential revolution that's about to happen. Right. Ephemeral. Excellent. I I I, I buy it. Uh, so I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. It's not that I didn't reveal myself. I I, I kind of. I, they didn't know me through this name. They knew that was my name. Right. But they they this they didn't have or, this or, relationship with me in the world. Or or my revelation in this world wasn't through that yes. name yet. That's, there might have been one moment right after Abraham bound Isaac on the altar that that he had a sense because he says Hashem Yireh right. Right, Hashem Yireh that, that name God sees me and will that name will be seen mm-hmm. but but, but it, it wasn't what Moshe is about to witness well, I, 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 I'll, I, I'll kind of uh, take your line uh, from before and say um, they had a sense 
that that was going to be the big mission. Yeah. They had a vision for it, but it was a vision. Yeah, and ultimately because it's a national. But now, but now it's not a vision. Now, no. it's, as you said, yeah, it's time it, to play ball. Yeah, because now there is a people. And, and by the way, that's that's also a message to us between the difference between exile, which is we were working on our just survival and kept going. Yeah. And now, I tighten it. It's the difference between the promise of redemption and redemption. Itself. Right. Right. Exactly. So that we're no longer living the promise. We're actually living the process. <laughs> if you if you remember, in the Matrix. In a comp- and the Matrix has all these lines, the first uh-huh. movie of the Matrix, that, that kind of sometimes are a little bit don't fit exactly. But <laughs> right after this kind of miraculous rescue at the very end, so Morpheus tells Neo, he says to him, one day you'll, you, you, you will soon learn something like that, that there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Yeah. And I think that's... That's, that's the, exactly it, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, but, but I'm adding to that that we, listeners to this show, in our time, in this day and age, we are in the... Process of redemption, right, no we're, longer we're just the promise. It. Right, we're up. Yep. Okay. Step to the plate, people. Uh, verse four. Vagam hakimoti ed briti. I shall also uh, raise up or, or or fulfill fulfill, fulfill. my fulfill my uh, covenant with them. Letet lahem et eretz knan to give them the land of Canaan, eretz megureim asher garuba, the land of those sojourns which they lived in. Right. Right. And this is to the promise that I made to the forefathers. Right. And now through this shem Hashem, I'm going to actually fulfill it. Right. V'gamani shamati et na'akat b'nei Yisrael. So too, I have heard the outcry of the children of Israel. Asher mitzrayim ha'avidim otam, which Egypt uh, enslaving. Enslaves, in the, enslaves them. V'eskoret briti. And, and, and I shall remember, or I have remembered, right. my covenant. Lachen, and therefore, emor l'vnei Yisrael. Tell the children of Israel, ani Hashem. I am the name of the Tetrachronaton. The ineffable name. I will take you from the subjugation of Egypt. I will rescue you from, from their enslavement, from their work. And I shall redeem you. Through an outstretched or strong arm and through great... Uh, judgments. Judgments, which also means kind of miracles. Yeah. I, have, I will take you for me to be a nation. V'hayiti lachem le'Elohim, I shall be unto you a God. V'yada'atem, and you shall know ki ani Hashem elokechem that I am uh, Hashem your God. I am I am uh, the ineffable name your God. Hamotzi etchem mitachat zivlot mitzrayim, which takes you out of the uh, the suffering. Suffering. That was the word. Thank you. Suffering of Egypt. V'heveti etchem el haaretz. I shall bring you to this land. Asher nasati et yadi, which I previously already kind of prepared. At least, yeah, which is a promise. And sati, that's a language of, of I raised my hand right. in promise. That's, by the way, this is the biblical um, source of that practice in Western culture, to raise your right hand and swear. Right. Beautiful. Asher nasati et yadi, I have raised my hand in an oath. Latetota, to give it to Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Venatati. And indeed, I shall give it to you. Ota, I shall give her to you, the land of Israel. Lachem, to you, to the nation of Israel. Morasha, an eternal inheritance. Ani Hashem. It's a lot and in that, there. That, that, yeah, and that word morasha, just two little points, and then I'll, 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 I'll throw the mic back to you. Morasha, a word appears twice in the Torah. Uh, the other time, it's in reference to internal to inheritance. Torah itself. To the Torah itself. Yeah, sure. And, and the rabbis say, the sages say, don't read it morasha, internal inheritance, but meorasha, which is like engaged, yes. betrothed. Yes. And you have to understand that the land of Israel is betrothed to the Torah. Well, betrothed uh, to the people, and right. the people are also betrothed to the Torah. Yes. Yes. The general reading is the land of Israel is betrothed to the, uh, the people of Israel, and the Torah is betrothed to the people of Israel. But I actually want to say differently that the two betrothals are to one another. The land of Israel goes with Torah. Okay, That's how you hold on to this land. That's, that's when it works. So we, we're not disagreeing. My only point was that um, the land and the Torah have no place to meet except through the people, right? The, 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 the land and the Torah are the two primary vessels, really, right. ultimately, through which we're meant to have a relationship with God. Right. right? And that's and what I was asking you last week. What's that? Which is, is God and Torah a separate thing? Right. No, and and, <clears throat> and the, the answer, ultimately, from God's perspective is no. And from our perspective, it's, it's a sort of aspirational, almost asymptotic relationship. So we can't sorry, get sorry. We can't get uh, to the God. Word, please? Asymptotic, like you know, remember what an asymptote is? It's something that you that you approach, you approach, you calculus. 
I didn't take calculus. Oh, okay. So we don't have that. to get into uh, into the nation, na- nature of uh, But I will be but, looking up, though. I'll be looking it up. Yeah, so so it, it basically, it's if you picture on a graph coming ever closer to the the, um, the asymptote, the, the line on the graph, but never actually reaching it. I mean, there's a point at which, of course, God being the infinite, we, we cannot. And so God, in his grace and love, gave us the Torah, which we are – see, I mean, I had this experience yesterday. I finished a semester of learning with my students, um, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And they always ask me, like, you know, where, where do we go with this? And I always point out to them and say, so where we've always gone. We've been doing this for over 3,000 years, and in this little class here in, you know, Pardes, Jerusalem, we've come up with new insights. Just think about that. 3,000 years of the same story, and it's new every single day. That is, that is, that's why one thing I like to say sometimes is, like, Torah is an intellectual person's endless... Oh, no question. Endless... I don't want to use the word playground because, because there are times in the Torah where some people, uh, even King David, kind of talks about Torah as though it's a pleasurable thing, right. a toy th- it's not a toy thing. But, well, it, listen, but it is an endless play is fertile, a, fertile yeah, field, and, shall we and say. And play is a sacred act. I mean, Shashua in Hebrew is not like you're playing around. It's the joy that you can take in the purity of engagement that's not utilitarian, which is also true in the Torah. is very useful. It has much practical wisdom, but there's something about entering into the deep and joyful engagement of Torah, which is really, in my mind, can only be compared to dance. Like in its purest sense, you know, it's, it's an old, it's an absolute engagement of something which is endlessly fascinating. I, I'm I'm a, I'm just I, I didn't you know I didn't expect you to say that you compare it to dance. That's that's very interesting. Oh, when I, I that's my experience to, of it when I when I'm teaching and learning. Are you a dancer? Uh, I was at a different time in my life. Oh. <laughs> we can we can talk about that sometime. We're not on there. Um, Flamenco, right? I can tell. No, nah, no, nah, we. We're not going there, but <laughs> but I actually want to come back to you, back to the parsha here, back to the parsha. All right, so so I just want to make one last point, and and I I, I have to say we have to wrap it up pretty soon. Here we do um, for various reasons. I just want to say one more point here, and that is in this uh, in this um, paragraph, but it's more than a paragraph. What do we want? Like a it's laying out a framework for redemption, right? Framework in this in this framework, but it's a, but it's also a kind of closed chapter. You know, for sure. A, uh, there is I, I can't get into it now. Sadly, we don't have enough time. There's the famous four uh, uh, languages, four words of redemption. Personally, and I, I feel very comfortable that I can prove it to you, there are 10, exactly 10, Ooh. Uh, uh, exactly perfectly 10 uh, languages of God's uh, framework. We'll have to talk about I'll, it some I'll, other time. I'll show it to you. You, you won't. I, I really feel pretty comfortable. You. Let me just prove it to you in one simple way. It's definitely not four. Everybody knows it's five, right? Because it's fifth, sure. The fifth is what? Veheveti. Veheveti, yeah. Yeah, but here we are in Heveti right now in the land of Israel that God has brought us here. But we still very much need Venatati, right? Uh Uh-huh, sure. So that's six. Uh Uh-oh. So you know it's not five. You know it's not four. And you know it's not five. And you know it's six. Once so, you get to six, you're already almost right. 10. That's yeah, my, with the that, Jews. That's what I remember. Yeah, for sure. Once you pass it, yeah, I right. got it. Okay. So, so there's, but, but, but there's exactly 10. But inside the 10, there's only one request of mankind of Israel. You only have to do one darn thing. You gotta do, all you got to do is one thing. The Jewish people are only responsible for one thing, and that is v'yadatan. Yes. You got to know it. That's and, your whole thing. And God will do it all. And notice how it, it buys us back to where, what God is saying to Moshe. Moshe says, wait, lama hariota. Like, why, you sent me here. You, you made things worse. And God basically says, lo no dati. Like, you have to understand that to know me, you have to live through the process. Yes. Don't stop short. Yes. Like, I see this all the time here in our beautiful country. People who come and they're, 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 they struggle or they're embittered or they look and they say, what a mess. It's politically, culturally, religiously a mess. And he just says, working on it. You know, in the middle of a process, all organic processes are messy. Anybody who's ever been at a birth, you know, if you, if you had never knew, didn't know what birth was, you had no idea what was happening, you walked into a, a, a delivery room, Halfway through a birth process, you'd think someone was dying. Yeah, you think of a, a murder scene. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and and yet if you walk in at the end and there's this beautiful baby, you say, oh, "That's incredible." Mazel tov. Yeah. So w- when you when you are able to hold the pain of the process, that's when you're actually able to birth something new in the world. And it's not for naught that that we say that the word yidia also means physical sexual intimacy in the Bible. We say we know someone biblically and because it's the intimacy of knowing that brings about newness in the world. And that's what God wants from us. That's it. That, that's, that's his big, that's our big job in this world is to know. Yes. Is to know. Yes. 
Okay, folks, with that, uh, we end this part of the show. Rabbi Mike Foyer, wonderful to see you today. Thank you very much. I feel like I've also learned Torah and also I feel a little bit psychologically more at ease, uh, which is good. And let us hope that through uh, this Torah show that we just did, together we will know uh, God better and understand why he's put us in this world and really also know our own mission Yes. without self-aggrandizement, but also without self nullification. Meaning to That's say, right. you know, what is our purpose here? How can we do things? And really seeing those uh, Chabad Hasidim yesterday dedicate their whole life to making people with MS and other, and other such things better. It's inspiration. It, it's an inspiration, absolutely. 100% an inspiration. All right, folks. Uh, there's more parts of the show today. We have Ashley Perry coming on next, talk a little bit about politics, Great. about the situation here in Israel. We'll, we'll kind of uh, look, at, uh, look at it from outside and inside. So stay tuned for that part. And Rabbi Mike Ford, thanks again for everything. God oh, bless you. Pleasure. God and of bless course, you too. people can reach you at Rav Mike. Rav Mike dot com, or they can find me Rav Mike Foyer on Facebook. That's right, Rav Mike Foyer, and of course, and Rav Mike at the Land of Israel Network. Did I Rav- say that we're in the, Ra- the Land of Israel Network? I don't, I don't think know. I, if I don't you think did I said it, it today. Right. Of course, we're on <clears throat> the Land of Israel Network. And Rabbi, Rav Mike, you have also another show here, which is called uh, the Jewish Story, uh, and that's doing great stuff and teaching a, a lot of in depth history. And this show, and of course, Josh Haston, and Ari and Jeremy, and Gil Hoffman, Shlomo Eve Cats. Harrow, Shlomo Katz, all the great folks that are on this network, please support it. Please be part of it. We're doing uh, our best to broadcast to the world God's truth, and that is what God is asking us, just to know, know his truth, especially in this time, this time of redemption. God bless you folks, wherever you are. Stay tuned for more. Rabbi Mike, thanks again. Good Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom, and stay tuned. Follow the path of the unsafe, independent thinker, says Thomas J. Watson. Expose your ideas to the danger of controversy. Speak your mind and fear less the label of crackpot than the stigma of conformity. I'm Rob Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Listen to The Jewish Story with Rav Mike Foyer on thelandofisrael.com. Shalom, everybody, and welcome back to the Yishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting from Judea to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are. Shalom, and welcome to Ashley Perry. Ashley Perry is a friend, also a former a senior Israeli government advisor, and today is the director of the Middle East Forum's Israel office. Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Yishai. Good to be here. And, of course, you've got that winning British accent, <laughs> which is always going to... You know, I, I once debated a British guy, and, and I said to, to the audience, I said... You know, uh, my my uh, my partner here, he's got an advantage because he sounds British, and, and studies have shown that that makes you sound writer in American ears. Uh, my only advantage is that I'm right, and uh, that was uh, that was my opening salvo against that. What, what do you think? I think we'll both be right today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Very good, Ashley. Uh, Ashley, uh, last night, uh, 8 p.m. here, Israel time, probably a day before everybody's hearing the show, or two days. Uh, there was a murder uh, in Samaria, close to the uh, community of Chavad Gilad. Uh, a rabbi was was murdered, gunned down. Uh, just, I think it was two days before, there was a similar incident there, but the terrorist's gun jammed. Okay, uh, so the, the the terrorist lobbied lobbed about twenty bullets towards the driver, who was a young rabbi, and this uh, young rabbi, uh, Rabbi Shevach, uh, he. Uh, was he didn't die instantly. He had enough time to hit his WhatsApp. He sent an audio message saying, I've been hit, please help me. Uh, and he was actually very well known for his humor, for his hospitality, for the fact that he was also a ritual circumciser, uh, also a volunteer for, for first responders, uh, and also a, a young scholar, a young Torah scholar that was already teaching at the age of 35. Uh, and uh, it was, it was, a, it was a, an- another one of these losses. Immediately, uh, Hamas issued... A communique saying they didn't take credit for it per se, but they said such exactly will be uh, the price, and we will the West Bank. They said will be a thorn in Israel's side. So that's what happened last night. Well, we know that even though the number of terrorist attacks over the last year has definitely plummeted, we know that their motivation uh, and inclination to kill as many people as possible has not gone down at all. And unfortunately, however good 
the response by the IDF is and however much they're trying to quell terrorism, unfortunately, it's just so difficult. And as we saw so painfully last night that another Israeli was murdered in cold blood by Palestinian terrorists. And as we know, they try almost every single day. Thankfully, the vast majority are stopped by Israel security forces. But unfortunately, they can't get to every single terrorist at every single opportunity, every single moment. And last night we saw that. And, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with the family and the community uh, of this uh, rabbi who, who was, uh, was murdered yesterday. And I hope uh, and pray that the, you know, that the perpetrators will be found and they'll be brought to justice. Right. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel signaled to the Europeans recently, so it kind of signaled that there has been many attacks that have been directed. This is not the first time he's done this, that he's basically said to the Europeans, there's been many attacks that we have foiled, uh, have stopped from happening on the European soil, and basically give us a little bit more of a break, because we're the ones protecting you. Uh, so he's kind of signaling that this kind of thing could happen overseas if it wasn't for Israel. Well, I think... I spent quite a number of years in the foreign ministry and in the foreign minister's office specifically, and we had many meetings with Europeans and other nations around the world. And there was a lo there's a lot of security coordination cooperation, and Israel remains at the center of the uh, the sort of international collaborative effort against global terrorism. And every you know normal and democratic and uh, liberal country knows the role that Israel plays in securing and assisting um, the, the local security forces to quell local terrorist threats. So I think he was saying something a little bit more public than has been said before, uh, the Prime Minister, but it is clear to the Europeans and others the, the significant role that Israel plays in combating global terrorism. Uh, do they, though, understand the significant role that the terrorists that are against Israel are, are work, how they're working to perpetrate attacks in Europe for example, uh, one of the things that, that, that is come, coming to, to the surface uh, is the connection of Hezbollah in global terror and in global drug trafficking like and, and crime. narco right, crime, narco traffic and, and, and how that creates a whole fiscal system by which money is transferred over to, uh, to, to Hezbollah. And one of the one of the huge news stories that came out, at least it kind of flashed very bright for a few minutes and then it went away, that was uh, the article that came out on Politico that it was uncovered that the uh, the two two American agencies, I think it was the CIA and also what's it called the the the, uh, the, the narcotics right right uh, what is it called not NRA. Uh, no, uh, the department responsible for combating illicit trades like narcotics. I, I can't right. remember the exact name. Uh, right. the, the, dr dr anyway, they uh, they were hot on the pursuit of the narco trafficking that was happening uh, through from South America through Hezbollah and with money ending up in, in South Lebanon, and that the Obama administration basically killed uh, those investigations uh, as part of their pro-Iranian stance. I can tell you something very interesting. There's a major disconnect in the international community between what goes on here and the terrorism that's perpetrated in their backyards. I think on the whole, you know, whenever there's an attack abroad, a lot of Israelis will say, oh, now they'll get it. Now they'll understand what we've been facing for decades. Unfortunately, there is still this perception amongst many that the terrorism perpetrated in France, in England, in the US, and other places around the world, these are crazies. These are Islamic, Islamist, fascist, Islamist, uh, you know, uh, crazies, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, all these other groups, which just, there's no way of reasoning with them. They don't really want anything except our complete destruction. And then they make a disconnect between uh, some of the terrorist organizations which are perpetrating atrocities against Israel, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, or others. And they say, no, that's different. These are freedom fighters. They're fighting the occupation. While we certainly don't agree with their methods, we understand to a certain extent what they're trying to do. And right. they do have a name. And it's, it's more rational. It's more logical. So there is a major disconnect. However... Basically justification. To a certain extent. But 
I think what's important to note is at the highest levels of government, of security agencies, of intelligence agencies, they do understand that this is different. There is a major connection between the attacks perpetrated abroad and attracts, attacks perpetrated here. There's always this sort of feeling that, you know, that what Israel is doing to a certain extent, uh, you know, against the Palestinians, as as it's perceived, is having a knock-on effect for citizens living in the West, where actually, on the contrary, I remember a couple of years ago, there were two British nat nationals who came to Israel to kill people. It was the Mike's Place bombing. I don't know if you remember that. And they found all these deep connections with Al-Qaeda and other attacks around the world. So if anything, uh, the, the global war of terrorism is actually having a, you know, multiply... Uh, effect here in 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 Israel, so it is completely connected. We see the connections between local Palestinian, Lebanese, and other uh, terrorist groups to the global war on terror, to the illicit global uh, drugs trade, uh, etc. We've known about this for for many many years. Latin America is a hot spot, and you know there's a lot of information about what's going on there. So it's not surprising that it's leading up to North America, the U.S. Um, this has been known, and Iran is a global player, right? You have, absolutely, you, you have it, it sees itself an absolutely equivalent. This is another thing people don't understand. Iran doesn't see itself as a regional player; it sees itself as a global power. It sees itself on the same level as America, right? And only now, uh, the the murder of Alberto Nisman uh, from uh, from South America is coming out. Uh, really, he was on hot on the tails. He's a prosecutor in Argentina, uh, st studying the Iranian connection. Uh, to the the bombings in Argentina in Buenos Aires, I had I had the honor of meeting him many years ago. Did you? Yeah, and I heard everything he had to say. And what and did he say? He basically said that Iran was behind the bombing of the Amia building, the Jewish uh, what would you call it, public Jewish building in 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 Buenos Aires. The JCC, Aires. if you will. right, and and the embassy, and he'd found the threads which connected directly to senior people in the Iranian government and in the Argentinian government. Well, the, the cover-up. The, the, well, the, the that, 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 came out, that came out later at the point where I met with him that uh -huh. hadn't been, because he hadn't completely filed his case at that point. Right. So he was, just, he was just putting it together. But the cover-up just demonstrates, unfortunately, the political reality which some are more interested in than saving lives and stopping those people who want to destroy even more lives. I mean, the people behind the, uh, these bombings are still very central in the Iranian uh, regime. And they haven't been touched, and it doesn't seem like they're going to be touched anytime soon because of the political realities surrounding all recent developments. And that's uh, another thing, by the way, that the Iranian people were rising up last week against Iran. Another story that was hot and kind of gets suppressed. And, and you wonder, you know, you wonder, first thing you wonder, how many people were killed in those riots? You wonder, what was really the motivations for those riots? You know, we hear that, 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 that the Iranian people are not happy about economic inequality. And if you're dealing with an Iranian regime who we know very well is willing to kill, these are regimes that know how to suppress, just like the Syrian regime, which is in cahoots with the Iranian regime. They know how to suppress without any qualms. Uh, and and uh, you had this internet blackout. The country just simply shut down internet connectivity out, out to outside of its borders. And information uh, just trickled out instead of uh, coming out normally i think even more than that i think we saw i think uh, it was about a year or two ago an iranian american journalist was detained and held in you know insufferable conditions in iran and that sent a bit of a message to the, he was working for the washington post i believe and that sent a bit of a message to the international media those that are allowed into iran that okay you can come and report but ensure that you don't go too far in your criticism of the regime and i think we definitely saw that in the reporting from the highest levels of the international media on what was going on in Iran. I mean, there was, I've, I don't know about you, but there was certainly a complete lack of clarity, you know, what was going on, whereas you rarely see that in other conflicts or, right. or revolutions or uh, street protests, etc. Certainly as opposed to what's going on here in Israel, right. where for every rock thrower, it seems like it's actually a type of press conference with, you know, 100 uh, folks from the press corps surrounding the, the thrower, almost as though they're in cahoots. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about uh, about Iran, the Iranian people. Uh, we talked also about uh, President Obama's interest in shutting down those investigations. I think the word I was looking for was DEA before. Um, but as opposed to President Trump, 
who was really eight years, I, I'll say it, I'll say it from, from, from my perspective, eight years of an anti-Israel presidency, uh, we have something very different happening right now with uh, wild Donald Trump, right? With, uh, with this completely different, um, uh, uh, different attitude, different feeling altogether coming out of Washington. And one of the major milestones, I think, of the last many years Maybe on the on the Obama side, it was signing with Iran, uh, basically the, the nuclear pact there. The nucle- not, not nuclear pact, but basically the nuclear. What do we call that? Kind of the. Uh, it was called. It's called the JCPO. It's the agreement for I- Iranian nuclear technology moving forward, sort of. Right, or, and 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 the secession of uh, of. Uh, the cessation of the sanctions on Iran uh, in the Obama years. So I think that was maybe the keystone uh, thing vis-a-vis the Middle East. And now you have President Trump recognizing Jerusalem. That was, I'm, you know, I'm sure for you, maybe I'll ask you instead of saying I'm sure. Uh, what, what was that like for you, that recognition of, of Jerusalem by President Trump? How did you see that? Well, listen, I think we have to go even further back than the uh, Obama administration. We have to go back 24 plus years to the handshake the famous handshake on the white house lawn between right. yasser arafat yitzhak rabin and bill clinton which was meant to be which was meant to bring in a new era a new era of peace uh, an end to the decades of uh, conflict between the israeli israelis arabs palestinians um and if we look back we're now in the 25th year since the signing of the oslo accords what have been the achievements are we closer to peace no has there been an end of conflict no why this is the question we have to ask ourselves, because I, I would argue for 24 years plus, there has been a certain paradigm which has accepted that Israel as the stronger party has to make the concessions, has to basically do everything that's necessary to bring this to bring this conflict to, to an end. And there's been tremendous pressure, not just from the Americans, but the international community for Israel to make some very, very serious uh, concessions, recognizing a uh, two-state solution, agreeing to uh, discuss, to begin negotiations uh, from the pre-67 lines, to put every single issue on the table, to talk about everything. To dividing to, Jerusalem. To, to basically every single issue. You know, uh, th- there was a settlement freeze, um, all these other things, basically just to ensure that the Palestinians came to the table. And what happens when they came to the table? Nothing happened. There were subsequent offers. There was the Clinton parameters. There was the Barack offer, Sheikh, 2001. There was the Annapolis talks. There were talks even after that. And it's interesting. I've spoken with a number of senior negotiators on both the Israeli and the American side. And they all said one thing. The territorial issue was always the easiest to solve. It was never really a major uh, uh, point of contention. What was the most difficult was to get the Palestinians to either, I mean, the, I believe these are all connected, to recognize Israel as the national homeland of the Jewish people and to sign an end of claims, end of conflict clause, which you would think, you know, at the end of a peace treaty, these should be the first things, these should be front and center, these should be the headlines, end of conflict, end of claims. If we sign this, sign on the dotted line, that's it, end of conflict, end of claims. And the Palestinians were never ready to do that, even when they were offered everything and the kitchen sink, according to what they claim are their goals, a Palestinian state, most of the territory, Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. And they were offered that by subsequent uh, Israeli administrations. Um, But the fact that they will not sign end of claims, end of conflict, the fact that they refuse, even though it will gain them so much, just to say the two words, Jewish state, means that this is an ideological conflict. And until people understand that it's an ideological conflict, we're not going to end it. So I think Donald Trump has taken something a little bit out of the box. It shouldn't be out of the box. It should be a little bit more logical. And has said, you know what? Enough of Palestinian rejectionism. The root of this conflict is Palestinian rejectionism, which stretches back over 100 years. Palestinian rejectionism of the Jewish people's right to live in this land, in sovereignty with self-determination. Until the Palestinian leader comes along and says, we recognize that, until we have a Palestinian leader who will not even scrub out the words two states for two people, What have we even got to talk about? So I think President Trump is seeing things a little bit differently. And he's saying, you know what? The Palestinians are not coming to the table when we've given them everything in the kitchen sink. We've tried the carrot. And they've 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 snubbed also. They've also snubbed it personally. We've tried the uh, carrot for 24 years. Let's start using a little bit of the stick. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, is he trying to use the stick to get them to the table, or is he coming to the conclusion that they're not coming to the table, and therefore it's not, it's not the stick to get them to the table? And certainly from my perspective, I don't want them at the table, right? I'm, I'm not interested in nego- negotiating with the Palestinians. I don't think we should ever have been negotiating with the Palestinians. I don't think we should be giving away our homeland, etc. cetera. Uh, but I, I get the sense that it's not really like we're going to force you back to the table. It's more like I'm starting to understand. This is my emotional understanding of President Trump. I'm starting to understand that you folks are going to diss me personally, and you're going to diss my vice president by, by, by letting the world know that you're not going to meet with him, which is really dissing of America. And you're not interested, so why should I be paying you? And this is, by the way, the same question as, uh, that, that I think should be out there more about the United Nations, even vis-a-vis not just Israel, but vis-a-vis America, which is why, uh, why should America be paying for this organization, which is going to snub it in its own country, right? It, it sits... The, the United Nations sits in America. Why, snub, why, why allow ourselves to be snubbed? I think basically what we're seeing for the last 24 years is the incentivization of rejectionism. In other words, you can do whatever you like. You can walk away from the table. You can say whatever you want. You can get involved with paying terrorists blood money and their families. Um, and nothing will happen to you. What does that do? It's, it incentivizes further rejectionism, further terrorism, further violence. So I think what Donald Trump is doing, he says that he wants negotiations. He says he wants the big deal. So I'm kind of you know, holding him to that. Um, so I think he's saying, I think he's using this more, as, more of a stick, but also recognizing what's right. You know, Jeruz- recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, he's not doing us any favors. We recognized Jerusalem as capital of Israel for, one would argue, 3,000 years. But obviously, uh, in the reestablished state of Israel, you know, for, for 70 odd years. Um, but America is basically doing something which at least three presidents have promised to do. It's something and which, which is, the American people passed into law. Right. And it's something which no other country has to suffer. No other country has to beg or say that this is our capital city. Every other capital city in the world is immediately recognized. So I don't think they're doing us any necessarily favors. With it. We welcome it, of course. But I think you found that it's, it's not an issue here because you found wall-to-wall acceptance and support for it from the left to the right because every Israeli accepts and agrees that Jerusalem is our capital city. So I don't think that that was necessarily um, anything other than an acceptance reality. And, also and, and that to was say his language, the p- by the way. That was his language. His language was... I am acknowledging the obvious. Exactly. And basically just saying to the Palestinians, you have pressure points as well. The international community has many pressure points. You talked about the financial aspect. That's massive. You know, the the, the Palestinians are able to do what they're able to do, especially its leadership, quite frankly, because of the taxes paid by individuals around the world, especially in America and large parts of the West. So they should come with ties. You know, if we're going to give you money, if we're going to give you diplomatic support, if we're going to give you political support, whatever it is, then you can't snub us and and stick your nose at us again and again and again. And I think Donald Trump is the kind of guy who won't accept that. And I'll I'll just say what you said in, in, in in a bit of different words, maybe just a, a tad more aggressively maybe, and that is that um, the world taxpayer that is paying the Palestinians is actually funding terror and terrorist support because at the end, as has been proven, and that's what Taylor Force, the, the act that was passed recently in Congress, which was really to stop funding uh, entities, the Palestinian Authority, if it continues this terror payout, payout to the families of terrorists, it's, it, there's there's a, almost like a giant moral question where, where the American people would stand up and, and ask their government, wait a minute, I didn't I don't want to pay you taxes that you pay terrorists. That's exactly the opposite of what and we, we see. And by the way, we're seeing this now. Defense Minister Lieberman just said that he's going to uh, remove amounts that are given over to terrorists and their families from the amount that Israel collects for the Palestinians through taxes. That's very interesting. And you were also close to uh, to Defense Minister Lieberman. And he has also talked, uh, you know, and he throughout his career has oftentimes come out with these kind of big statements, sometimes bombastic, uh, in order to to kind of show his bona fides as a kind of hawkish. And if there's anybody that's like hawkishly in, in his demeanor tries to kind of send, send that signal out, it's Defense Minister Lieberman. And I would, I would also say that he's probably in his, really his best post in the Israeli government, really where he kind of belongs. Uh, he's recently been talking about 
in trying to propose a bill of death sentence to to terrorists. And there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of pushback against that. Tell me a little bit about about that way of thinking and that bill. Well, I think that there's there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding this bill. And Israel we're speaking with you. Yeah, <laughs> Israel has the death penalty. Right. It's only ever been used twice. Uh, most famously against Adolf Eichmann, uh, the architect, um, or at least the facilitator of the Holocaust. Um, but since then, it hasn't really been used, even though it is an option uh, for Israeli judges. But up until now, it has to be a unanimous decision. Th there are usually three justices which sit on, on cases of murder, and basically it has to be unanimous. All three justices have to agree to the death penalty uh, for it to then... Uh, be enacted, and that's never happened in history. There have been many occasions where it's been two against one, uh, but because of the law, that's irrelevant. As long just, as one, just, just let me interject for a second that according to Jewish law, as opposed to Israeli law, if for 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 uh, for a death penalty, it's twenty three judges that have to sit together. However, if there is a unanimous decision to to execute somebody, that decision is thrown out. Because there's something wrong with a decision that right, is unanimous. Right, right. That's according, just interestingly, right, that's according right. to Jewish law. So here, so here, basically what this law does is it, it, it creates a majoritarian uh, concept where if the majority of judges believe that there should be a death penalty, then the death penalty will be enacted. So that, that's really what this law is. not creating the death penalty in Israel. It's just basically amending and adjusting the law uh, to try and act as a deterrent for would-be terrorists. Now, a lot of people said, well, these, a lot of these terrorists, they want to die. You know, suicide bombers obviously want to die. And a lot of others understand when they're out there in the field, like the, the, the assassination yesterday, that there's a good chance that they may die at some point. First of all, the guy yesterday obviously didn't want to die because he probably was skulking in bushes and, and ran away. Um, but the more terrorists. Exactly, the terrorists. But more importantly, it's the people that send them. Marwan Balguti, for example, never physically killed anyone uh, in his life. Who is Marwan? Marwan yeah. Balkuti is a uh, senior, uh, senior Palestinian leader who is an arch-terrorist and was responsible. I think he was convicted of 30 deaths. I'm sure he was responsible for a lot more, but he was convicted in Israeli court for at least 30 Israeli deaths. Um, and he's now serving something like 30 life uh, uh, sentences with the hope that he may be traded at one point. That's the Palestinian hope. Um, when he was found, he certainly did not want to be arrested. And there are very interesting stories of how cowardly and scared he was when he was found. So someone like that may have another thought if they know that there's a good chance that they may receive the death penalty. Obviously, the suicide bomber, it's irrelevant to, but it's the people behind them who should start thinking carefully again, do they want to be involved in these actions? And I think that's what this uh, bill is trying to uh, uh, do. So, uh, Ashley Perry, we've uh, really... Uh, covered a, a gamut uh, of not so n not such easy issues. You know, we started really with the individual terrorism that, and, and the murder uh, of a rabbi here in Israel yesterday, uh, last night, uh, as we're recording this, and we've gone through the, the questions of uh, President Obama, uh, President Trump, um, you know, terror funding, and now also um, the issue of the death penalty to try to bring back deterrence, to bring back deterrence. Is there just a gen and this is a short kind of question here at the end? Do you, do you sense that there's a there's an atmospheric change here in the body politic of I Israel from your long experience, your many years in Israeli government? The, is there a shift to a more nationalistic, what some would call right wing position in general, vis a vis the fact that there is a Trump right there t uh, today? There is a change also in Eastern Europe. Certainly, there's the kind of a, a rejection of the uh, influx of Islam into Eastern Europe. There are more of these parties, like the party in Austria. Uh, the, the leadership in Austria and, and other such phenomena. Do you sense that the Israeli body politics is shifting to the right? Because polls for the next elections, which are still in the offing, uh, are not showing a big shift to the right. They're pretty much showing more or less hold, even maybe two seats swinging more to the center left, potentially. But of course, these are very early polls, don't right. matter. So I wanted to ask you kind of a general question about the atmosphere here in Israel. Well, I can tell you that from all the polls that I've seen, the right-wing bloc, and for those who don't understand Israeli politics, it will probably take me about <laughs> two days to explain it. But basically, we have multiple parties, and they usually fit within, again, it, it's not hard and fast rule, but usually between a right-wing and a left-wing bloc. And at the moment, the right-wing government, because it had a majority in the last elections, not because it had the largest parties necessarily, uh, got, got to form the government. According to all polls that I've seen, there has been tremendous movement within the blocs, within the left-wing bloc, people 
leaving the Labour Party, the, the Zionist Union for Yeshatid, but we haven't seen so much movement across the blocks. Maybe a seat here, a seat there, but I always say until we know what elections are about, until we know what the issue is that the government fell, until we know what, what has been framed as the issue of the elections, it's impossible to say because, for example, Yeshatid, Yeshatid doesn't uh, really concentrate or the is, not, party. Right, is not as well known for, let's say, security issues. So if the elections about security issues, which quite frankly most Israeli elections are about, then it probably won't do as well as if it was on religious state issues or corruption issues, which they've made really as their sort of uh, headline issues. And, and so just parenthetically, I just want to say there was a major religious issue that, that right. rose up this week, and that was a bill about these mini markets that exists in cities where the uh, head of the interior ministry uh, from the Shas party, the Sephardic party, really wanted to pass a law. Ultra-Orthodox party. The ultra-Orthodox Sephardic, thank you very much, uh, wanted to really bar these uh, these uh, bodegas, we call them in New York, but like uh, many super mini markets, from being open on Saturday. And it was very, very interesting how it came down. For example, uh, and I retweeted this, uh, uh, Defense Minister Lieberman wrote something like, we are for tradition, we're against religious coercion. For the right. Sabbath, right. but against coercion. And that bill did pass by a squeak. Uh, right. But it was certainly very By one vote. Yeah, by but, one vote. Right, I think, I, think uh, I have a number of things to say about this. I think the first thing to say is that this is part of what I would call the election build-up. We're now in a pre-election campaign. Now, it won't be tomorrow, it won't be next week, it may not even be next month, it may be in six months, but I can tell you that most Israeli parties are starting to put their, you know, lick their finger and put it to the air to, s to see where the winds blow, and they're understanding that elections are coming. Elections have to come next year, and no government in the history of the State of Israel has ever seen out its complete term. So everybody knows that elections are coming sooner or later, and probably they will come this year. I would certainly predict that they will come uh, this year. So a lot of parties are, are trying to go back to their base with some of these laws. And 2018 to, is an election year in your mind. Um, I, 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 if I was a betting man, which it, I'm not, I right. would. I would. I would put money on that. Okay, very I'd good. put money on uh, elections being called in 2018. Um, so, we, you know, at the end of the day, this supermarkets or Marcolet bill, as they called it, uh, basically won't do anything because the municipalities are the ones who have to go out and enforce it. And most of them won't have a the stomach for it or the staff, because if you have the staff, who are they? They're Jews. And to enforce it, you'll have to have Jews breaking the Sabbath. So right. it kind of, uh, it, listen, as I said, it was it was about trying to flex your muscles. It was about speaking to the base. And at the end of the day, the prime minister wants stability at this point. At this point, it could be in a few months, depending on what happens in his personal cases, he may be willing and ready to go to elections, but this is not the right point for him. So he wanted stability at any cost. And he knows, and I've been involved in not numerous elections in Israel, people fortunately or unfortunately, depending where you stand, do not vote on religion and state issues. The amount of Israelis who do is very small. The amount who vote on other issues is very large. And when every single uh, party leader reads these statistics and reads these polls and understands that this is, not an election, this is not an issue you can go to elections on, most of the government stood in behind. As you said, Avigdor Lieberman didn't because it was a, an issue of principle and also because many of his uh, electorate are not necessarily religious. But he himself, as a traditional guy, believes that we should find that fine balance between tradition and coercion. By the way, uh, and, and with this we'll, we'll finish off, I was at an event which I helped create, which was um, the Aliyah Day celebrations. It was a law that was passed based on a bill that I had written Got uh, that bill got rejected, but rewritten almost the same way, and it passed. Uh, Victor Lieberman was one of the speakers, and it was it was really it was really fun because he said uh, he got up there, and there was a big audience of like Russians and French, and he goes, "This week in the Torah portion we read." Oh, he goes, "This week we read about the first immigrant to the land of Israel. Who was that?" Everybody is like. I don't know. You could just see people were just they didn't know, right? <laughs> and he's like, it was Abraham. And I, I, was, I, I will always remember that, that he was the one that brought up the issue of Abraham being the first pilgrim, which, by the way, was the idea of when we placed that law right. close to, exactly. to Parshat Lech Lecha. That was the, the original idea. In any case, Ashley Perry, former senior Israeli government advisor, director today 
of the Middle East Forum's Israel office. I want to thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's been great. All right, folks, you are listening to the Ishai Fleischer Show. Stay tuned. A few more words, and we'll be right back. Josh Haston here, host of Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Radio Network at thelandofisrael.com. Make sure you check out my show every Monday, bringing you the news unfiltered and uncensored information that you are not getting anywhere else, especially not in the mainstream media. Israel Uncensored with Josh Haston on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show today. We had Rabbi Mike Foyer, uh, great stuff of the Torah portion. I think that we could all agree that uh, we got a little bit closer to understanding the, the real uh, message behind what the Torah is trying to tell us and really to know God. And then we spoke with Ashley Perry, uh, former senior advisor to the Israeli government, uh, and uh, he helped us understand a little bit of the political realities that we're facing here. I also want to thank so much the folks that make this show possible. First thing, uh, Ben Bresky for editing. Uh, Moshe, uh, Moshe Herman, my, my man, uh, out there in the world, getting the show out to you, Mr. Broadcaster himself. Mr. Broadcast, get it out to the world. Of course, Tabitha, uh, our webmaster at uh, the Land of Israel Network. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank all the good folks that's, that have donated to the show, my good friend Sarah Z, uh, and my good friends from uh, Switzerland, and my good friends uh, all around the world, of course, um, my good friend Cynthia, who really makes this show happen, thank you so much, and thank you for helping get Tor out to the world. My good friend Jack, Jack and Lillian, uh, my good friend Betzalel, uh, my good friend uh, Danny, Danny K. There's many more. There's many more. I'm not, I'm not going through the list right now, and if I didn't say your name, I'll say it next time, I promise you. I want to hear from you as well. Write me an email, yishai at thelandofisrael.com. I also want to urge you to visit uh, the sponsors of the show, not because they're the sponsors of the show only, but also because... Uh, they are fabulous in what they do themselves, and we're going to have more sponsors coming up. We're going to be sponsoring, we're going to be sponsored by and helping promote uh, building, uh, buying Jewish property in the north. That's coming up. Uh, next show's coming up soon. Um, and you're going to have a great opportunity to buy in the land of Israel, and I certainly urge that wherever you are. Uh, but also, Tchele, T E K H E L E T, Tchele, the blue string, the true blue Jew. Those prizes that, that people won a few weeks back are going to be sent out soon. I'm very excited about that. So that's Tchelet, T-E-K-H-E-L-E-T, Tchelet. And that is just a mitzvah of our time. That is the mitzvah of our time. And especially if you're not yet totally plugged into the land of Israel one way or another, get to Tchelet. That will, that will take you one step further and one step closer. My good friend Arthur uh, has already done the Tchelet and a lot of other people, including Rabbi Mike himself. Uh, Hebron.org, Hebron, excuse me, Hebron.com or HebronFund.org will help you come to the fathers and mothers in Hebron where I work and where I have the pleasure of working and uh, just, just an amazing organization headed by one of our uh, faithful listeners to the show and, and a person who's doing an amazing job at leading that community, which is Uri Karzen, Director General of the Hebron Jewish Community. HebronFund.org will bring you there. Our good friends at Django, Django.net, help promote so many good things about living in the land of Israel and communicating in the English language so that you know how to, how to run through the various challenges uh, uh, that the bureaucracies, because remember, we're Jewish and bureaucratic, right? That's uh, uh, one of our challenges here in the land of Israel. So that's Janglo.net. And our good friends at jbrick, jbrick.com. Buy, you know, your kids love Lego. So many kids love Lego, but make it a Jewish Lego, right? Just like we need Jewish entertainment and Jewish things to, 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 to make our life filled with. So, you know, you could, you could buy a Star Trek, Star Wars Lego set, or you could buy a Jewish Lego set like the Maccabees or other things. I think it's very important, and I got to get Yitz, and I'm working with Yitz at Jbrick to make uh, Marat HaMachpela a, um, a tomb of the fathers and mothers uh, uh, model, Lego model, a big one for the museum and a small one for you to have in your house so you can connect to the fathers and mothers. And with that also, I just want to finally thank um, God Almighty for, for giving us the opportunity to be here today to broadcast His Word as faithfully as, as we can God give us the strength to continue to do it even better, even stronger, um, uh, even more correctly, even more uh, close to your word and help us le lead a life where you and, and your directives lead us and, and not our kind of um, lesser selves, but our greater selves that are connected to your truth and your Torah. Uh, amen. Amen. God bless you wherever you are, folks. Do write me an email, yishaytelandofisrael.com. 
Check out my Facebook page, my Twitter. And it's not because of me, but because I, like you, am trying to broadcast God's truth to the world. And thank you for being a part of it wherever you are. Stay tuned. Stay strong. Stay connected. God bless you. And shalom. <laughs>